Hello, hello everybody, it is 4.40 p.m. Central Time on the 28th of November, 2020. It is Saturday here in the United States. Hope you're doing well. Uh, my voice might have a little bit of an echo behind it. The office is somewhat empty. Got it cleared out to put up the Christmas tree. Probably tomorrow I'll turn on the camera and you guys can watch me decorate the stream Christmas tree. <laughs> You can celebrate Christmas vicariously through me. If you don't celebrate it, if you're a Grinch or you don't celebrate Christmas, well, you're going to get to celebrate it through me. All right. All right. <laughs> we're here to talk about earthquakes, and I hope you're doing well, like I said. And we're looking at Earthquake 3D, the program. If you don't have a copy, you should probably get a copy of it. There's a free version, a paid version. And the paid version just allows you to combine feeds, which I recommend that you do if you can. We're using the USGS and the EMSC coming out of Europe. Just to give us a good idea of what struck, we're looking at about 48 hours worth of earthquakes. Actually, we're looking at just a little bit more now, looking at about uh, 72 hours, three days worth of quakes here. And the reason I'm doing that, the reason I'm showing you two to three days worth of quakes, we look for a couple days to get a good idea of the areas that are moving now so we can determine the next areas that are likely to move. So let me take you back a couple days when I did my last update. We are talking about this earthquake here, marked in a pinkish color, a 5.5. Now that 5.5, when it struck, I told everybody to watch two directions, one over to Africa and the other up to the north, to the Gulf of Aden. So far, a spread of the same sized earthquakes, 4.7, 4.8, 4.5, going all the way up to the Gulf of Aden, up into the Red Sea, and beyond all the way up into Turkey. Now let's get all the smaller earthquakes out of there so you can see this. This is a pretty amazing equal spread of quakes coming across the Indian Ocean and the same sized earthquakes going across China, Afghanistan, Iran, and again pooling back up over here in Europe. Let me show it to you on the USGS plate boundary map. This might make a little bit more sense. Okay, so here we are, West Pacific, and you can see the red lines here. These are the plate boundaries. Now, coming up into China, going over to Afghanistan, over to Iran, over to Turkey, we have a line of earthquakes in the last 48 hours. Again, they're marked in a pinkish color from yesterday and going into light pink from last night. Same thing going on down here, and the whitish colored earthquake struck today. Now, let's compare the Indian Ocean to the earthquakes again, starting here, going up to the north, up to the Gulf of Aden, here going up into the Red Sea. USGS map is 24 hours, so it doesn't show much. On here, these almost equal spaced earthquakes going all the way across the plate boundary, I want you to compare that to this. And I've shown it so many times, but I'm going to show it to you again. A spread, a standing wave going through a tank, where each wave is about the same size. As more energy gets pumped in, Instead of it getting chaotic and jostling around, the waves organize into a standing wave. Now you'll see each wave height or each peak goes into the previous valley perfectly where there's a middle point between the two that gets filled in between each wave. In other words, each wave fills in the previous wave's middle point or fulcrum point. Now just remember that as the wave spreads through the tank, you see each wave gets higher and higher as more energy is pumped into it but the same size spreads out across the tank. In this case, we're not dealing with a tank. We're dealing with plate boundaries. <laughs> this goes all the way up into the Middle East, and it goes all the way down here south of Madagascar. And look at the earthquake. So down here at the bottom side, south side of Madagascar, 5.2, all the way up here, going all the way up into Europe, fours spreading out and again accumulating right here at this point. So I would expect the next step over to the west, the combined total of what's coming from this way and coming out of Europe or out of Asia going into Europe will combine and strike here east of Crete. So far, we've only seen fours. Those fours are actually from two days ago. So we're expecting it to come rolling in back into South Europe here pretty soon. But again, I just have to point out the equal spacing on these quakes is just phenomenal. It's a perfect example for people if you want to show them how seismic activity spreads out across a region. Now, people in Africa contacting me, I know, yeah, people in Africa contacting me, right? 
that's awesome in its own right as a video maker to reach people all the way around the world. Now, they were telling me that there was some kind of seismic activity reported in here in Africa, but I don't see anything reported by the USGS or EMSC. If you guys have any information on that, please shoot me a message or an email over at midwestgeophysics at yahoo.com, and uh, I will check that, and again, we'll try to get information on that. Now, let's go over here around Australia, but to see this, you have to actually look from a very far away perspective. The earthquake's going all the way around the plate boundary down to the south, up to the northeast, and back around to the north side of Australia compared to this. And you'll see we have a good match going all the way around on the plate boundary. So everywhere, oh, look at that, right in the middle of the area I was just talking about. Look at that. The middle point at the catcher's mitt in the Bay of Plenty in North New Zealand at 3.7 just struck at 2242 UTC. It's now 2246. So four minutes ago, right in that middle point, but it's just a small earthquake. We have White Island Volcano right there. So that middle point just got filled in. But again, look at this going all the way around it. And we have to go over to the Indian Ocean and back up through the fracture zone to the north, connect back up to Europe back across, down, and around back into Indonesia, and match it. Look at that. All the way around. Back up and down this way, and all the way around and back down and around this way, down south of New Zealand, back past New Zealand, and back around. In other words, the whole plate has just moved in the last day and a half, two days, on at least a 4 to 4.5 basis, and that's a huge area to move in such a short period of time. So what could push all of this going up to India, again, going up to China, back down and around south of Madagascar, going back down to New Zealand and back over as far as Fiji? Let me carry on because really there's an area connected to this that also shifted. Look, our letter X, letter X hit. X marks the spot in the middle of the South Pacific. Now we can trace that fracture zone back to the undersea mount chain here which goes back to the north and connects right to where all of our deep earthquakes have come pushing in on the underside of the plate. Now let me show this to you again from the start of this video. Make sure you can see it really good. Now the deep earthquakes, what I think is going on here is there's a hammering action coming in on the underside of the plate out of the more liquid-like magma in the asthenosphere down below the plate, which is really a semi-melted magma area, so it's more plasticky, if you will. And this standing wave forms in on itself, and the combined force of the whole wave comes into a singularity point, a spike, which hammers up and puts the full force of the whole wave up and into whatever's above it. And in this case, I think it's happening down below the plates, and down below the plates, we have the magma, which hammers into the underside of the plate with no gap in between. So that standing wave forms in and goes straight up into the solid, out of the fluid. And then this happens, I think, where we have the standing wave that spreads out and away. So first, this hammers in. One more time, watch it. The full force of the wave focuses in on itself and hammers up, since the fluid doesn't compress much, if at all. And boom, hammers in, then spreads out in a standing wave. Now, we're talking about a very low frequency here that this would be happening in, so I think that's what's causing it, is a very low frequency being emanated out from even deeper down in the Earth. The deep earthquakes are being caused by something. By the way, the deep earthquakes are raised high off the globe for easy identification purposes, and this is the past two to three days. So clearly, something's going on down below the plate. Now, if you're new here, let me just quickly show you. Our letter Ds stand for deep earthquake forecast points, where we watch for new deep earthquakes to take place. South of Japan down in Indonesia, over to Fiji, all of these areas where the letter Ds are in the past two to three days. Look where our deep earthquakes have struck, right on the letter Ds or right next to them. So something again is leveraging up on the underside of the plate here at Fiji, here at Indonesia at the edge of the plate there, up at Japan at the edge of the plate here, all the way around. And then the plate next to it, next to the Pacific, starts to shift all the way around it. But it's not stopping there. Like I just showed you, it goes down to the South Pacific, following these, here, let me show it to you one more time, these underwater fracture zones, 
or sub C. They even go down, I think, further into the plate pretty far. Oop, one second. Okay, apologize for that, guys. Got my cup of coffee here now. Ah, ah yes, room service. <laughs> ah, thank the Duchess. Okay, here we go. So, going across the fracture zone, and we go back across, down across the Pacific. Look, same sized activity, 5, 5.5, 5.7, spreading out down towards Chile. Then, to seal the deal, our other letter X was struck down here at the South Sandwich Islands. As expected, I issued the warning for this a few days ago to watch for the energy to come from the central southeast Pacific here, travel down and go down to the South Sandwich Islands in this trajectory. That just happened. So the whole South Pacific, all the way over really technically into the Atlantic and all the way over here south of Africa has displaced in the last day. 48 hours if you really want to go the full distance on the time frame. So in roughly two days or over a day, but under two, all of this has happened. Now we get up to the north and we have another set of deep earthquakes, but in between we have some areas that should start to move. Those middle points again, so for instance, Taiwan. I have not checked the Volcanic Ash Advisory Center. Let's go see what's on the Volcanic Ash Advisory Center. I think a new volcano showed back up yesterday. Uh, of, uh, not back up. A volcano that we have not reported on ever. So let's go down the list. Epico up in the Kuril Islands. Okay, a 10,000 foot high blast. Sabancaya in Peru. Suwanese in Ajima in Japan. Fuego in Kluchetskoy. Sanjay in Semeru. 16,000 foot high blast at Semeru. Pretty big. I'll show you where these are. But let's go get the volcano that's never been on the list the entire time that I've been streaming or making videos. Luo Tolo. Luo Tolo. I think actually the last eruption was 2012, so I was making videos back in the day. But 2012, I mean, come on, eight years? It's been eight years since Luo Tolo volcano erupted? Let me show you where that is. All the way over here in Indonesia. It's coming in right over here next to East Timor. Here it is. Luo Tolo. And it might be Lewo Tolo or Liwat Tolo. Or I, I'm not going to try to even go look it up. It doesn't really matter the pronunciation. You can see the location. It is here in central eastern south Indonesia. South central eastern Indonesia. So we have another volcano and that's Mount Semeru, which is erupting over here. And we also have Mount Sinabung, which is also erupting all the way back up here two days ago. So we have a few eruptions going on across the area, but the new one on the list, the one all the way over here, Semotolo or Luotolo, that is something we have to pay attention to when we see a new volcano pop off. Why? Well, it means there's energy in the area of Indonesia, enough to set off a volcano that doesn't normally go much. So all the regular suspects are going, like Dukono and Semeru and Cinnabung, but you throw in a new one, and it's right in the middle in between all of the other earthquakes that have struck in the last day. You have to take that into account that there's something going on right in here on the plate boundary, which could be leading to a new large release. Now, I would look between our current sets of earthquakes, and it's a jumbled mess right here in the middle north of Indonesia, but we have a big open area with Bali centered right at the center of the giant open area here, about 1,000 miles across or 800 miles across. We have a 4.6 and a 4.4 and a 4.5, or how about this, 4.4, 4.5, 4.6 on one side of Indonesia, and on the other, 4.5, 4.6, 4.7, 4.8, and some deep earthquakes, plus a new eruption at a volcano that doesn't normally go. That would put a lot of stress up on the underside of the plate here, where the red lines are, and with all the other activity, another way to look at it, that that's the dead center of the whole hot mess, on the edge of it, I mean. The edge of the center of the whole mess all the way around let's go back and look at the plate boundary from a great distance that if we're moving all the way around up back down and around this way that this really is sort of the center of the edge or the edge of the center 
And that's where the new eruption is. So it's a lot going on. And I haven't even gotten into Europe yet. We're still in Asia and the West Pacific. This is going to be a long update. So going over into Europe, we spread out into South Europe, where we've gone quiet across Italy. Now, up into the north part of Europe, we have a bunch of threes up to 3.8. Even the English Channel was hit two days ago. We also saw activity go out towards the Azores a few days back. But let me show you the plate boundaries in Europe. Look at Italy. Do you see the red line? You see what it does? It goes up and dead ends into Switzerland or the south point of the Alps. There's an open area across western and south central Europe, across Spain and France. But the plate boundary dead ends up into the mountain range. That's, of course, the Alps. But back down across, we expect seismic activity to take place back down across all of Italy. So it's pooled up here, back in Greece, where we had our seven-point-something earthquake and tsunami, as well as a bunch of fours and fives spread up into Central Europe right here by Bosnia and Croatia, fours going up into Poland, fours going up into Switzerland. But it's all been stuck back here. Now, I would expect a new break to take place in between the two areas that are moving. That's in any spot on the planet, we expect that. So let's just look at the plate boundary map this way. We have a bunch of earthquakes over here. Again, Spain, Portugal, plate boundary going out towards the Azores. And we have a bunch of earthquakes over here at the W-shaped bend in the plate at the Mediterranean going back to Turkey. Not much activity in the middle. We expect the middle to break. So we look between our current sets of earthquakes for the new earthquake to strike. And that brings us right down in here in the middle. I guess that puts us to Florence. Florence, Italy, north of Norcia. Turin and Milan are to the north. Venice is over to the east, so the northern part of Italy. And then down here to the south, as far south as, let's see our point at Campobasso. So the point in the middle is Florence, right where the arrow tip is, over to the east of the arrow tip, the back side of the arrow right here. So I would expect that to break, and it should be something bigger than what's on both sides. So on one side, we have a bunch of threes going up to 3.8. And on the other side, we have a bunch of threes and a few fours. I think the highest we go here is 4.6. So if we add it all together, it gets to 4.7 to 4.8. That puts us in the mid-range four level. It's not enough to cause major damage, but it is enough to definitely wake you up in the middle of the night. If it strikes in the middle of the night, you might think it might be something bigger happening. But let everybody there know it should be in the forest range. And I hope I got the magnitude right on there. It, again, don't fault me, no pun intended. If it comes in an upper three level, because we are dealing with upper threes on both sides too, but I would think something bigger would strike in the middle. Luckily, right now, all that's on the menu so far, as far as I can see, even with this all coming together in Greece, that Italy right now will wait for Greece. Look, Greece is the spot where it's all coming together. So that's the spot where I think something bigger will strike. The combined total of all these fours coming in which should go back up into the 5 to 5.5 range, maybe even bigger, 5.9, over at the east side of Crete. But Italy right now is the silent zone between our two zones that are moving. So there's two things that are going to happen, North Italy and Greece. Again, it, it, it's so obvious. You can see it. Let me back it out so you can see it. This is the last two to three, three days, 72 hours worth of earthquakes. So it's like a path leading right to you, or a flowing river, that two rivers that are coming together in Greece. Okay, now let's jump all the way over across the Pacific. And by the way, Hawaii is swarming. We'll talk about Hawaii in a second. It started to move. Look at this line of quakes going across Central America. So like we expected, going down around at the travels underneath point, there was a deep earthquake here in Argentina. And I told everybody when it hit, that's energy coming into South America. It's going to try to go down and around, which it did. Went down to Antarctica's tip. Then now over to the east on the edge of the plate. All the way down here. Let me show it to you on the USGS map. Whoops. Right here. South Sandwich Islands travels down around and underneath the plate. A path of least resistance. Now we'll get into this 5.1 in just one second because up to the north, our activity took place that we were expecting, but it came in just slightly lower than what I was looking for. 4.7. Now, I was looking for 5.0, 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, 5.4, 5.5, 5.6, 5.7, 5.8, 5.9, 5.10, 5.11, 5.12, 5.13, 5.14, 5.15
but another 4.2 struck over here on the east side of Haiti, or Dominican Republic, I mean. East of Haiti, in the middle of the Dominican Republic, 4.2. Now, if we take the 4.7 plus the 4.2 and an additional 4, well, 3.9, we get about a 4.82. So, in other words, an upper 4 to near 5 struck across the area, now that technically the area I warned was right here at the northwest side of Puerto Rico or on the western side of Puerto Rico, and it struck over here on the eastern side of Puerto Rico. Nonetheless, there it is. That's the earthquake we're looking for, at least the size. And it traveled across, and you got to remember, Cayman Islands also got hit a few days ago, and we had warned Cayman Islands as well. And Cayman Islands right here, right on the back side of the arrow. Let me show it to you. There we go. So look at, look at it this way again. In the last three to four days going from Central America, across Cayman Island, over here into Dominican Republic, and over here east of Puerto Rico. Again, they're ones cutting the other in half. Ones bisecting the other. The standing wave is spreading out across the tank. All about the same size waves, within a hair of a point of one another. And it's spreading out, almost equally, as best as it can, across this uneven wave tank which is a waveguide more like it. Instead of a tank, it's more like a waveguide in a microwave. <laughs> Guiding the VLF. Do you guys know what a waveguide... Uh, never mind. Oh, God, we could dork out on microwaves for the next two hours. I'm not talking about microwaves here. I'm talking about Mother Nature's waves. So we're talking about VLF, but it's being waveguided by the plate boundaries. That's amazing. Okay, so recapping, equal spread of earthquakes all the way across going over. Look, look at this in the last couple days, guys, for real. So going across over into Europe, spreading out across all of the plate boundaries up to the north, and going across down to the south and southeast. Now, finally, right in the smack middle between our X's, well, the middle if you go around the bends and folds of the plate, which I'll show you in a second, we have a 5 down here, and up here we have energy coming in, but it hasn't reached out to our two X's further to the east. So energy is saturating all the way around this. Just like, do you see the, the red lines? Going down to South Sandwich, up to the north, to the Caribbean, and over to the east and back down and around. The middle point here, again, if you were to straighten this all out, you would get this as the middle point between these two areas, or rough middle. And the same thing that's happening in South America just happened over here around Australia going up to India. So this all just moved around it. And this all just moved around it. There's only a couple spots to fit in, fill in, that need to fit in. And that's right here going across Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, and going back down across our X's too here. So basically the equatorial region has yet to move. The rest has moved all the way around and it's going to be probably pretty big because the way I'm looking at this is now we have two plates on either side shifting and in the middle that's where all the pressure is coming up underneath the West Pacific. So we have to look at this at a, on a grand scale. Pressure is coming up from Japan down below Fiji back over to Indonesia going over to Argentina and going all the way over here to the Middle East at Afghanistan. Deep earthquakes are happening mainly across here, the western side of the West Pacific, which then is leveraging up and displacing the whole plate next to it and the whole plate next to it over to the east. Over to the east, South America, over to the west, Australia going up to India. Now what about up to the north? Let's go look. We have a quiet zone again. And you could say that's almost the equatorial region as well, just to the north, actually, the tropics. But it's quiet here across Taiwan. Yesterday it moved in Japan, but in the last day, three different earthquakes. The spacing on them is perfect again, where one is in the middle of between point between the other two. Going up across the plate boundary here, the red line shown on the USGS map. One to the south, one at the center, one to the north. And at the center, right here where the 4 is, that is the deepest of the bunch, coming in at 280 kilometers deep. Technically, that's a deep earthquake. That's down below the plate, right here at the H-shaped bend in the plate. 
deep earthquake down below here, fours on either side, equal spacing. Again, that wave spreading up, out, and away. Up to the north, our bigger of the bunch, the biggest is the 5.3. And then spreading out away from the 5.3, following the plate boundaries all the way over into Alaska, 4.0, 4.5, 4.6. Let me show it to you on the USGS map here. Going over to the east up into Alaska, following the red lines again. New eruption right in the middle of this whole hot mess, right next to the 5.3. Let me zoom in and show you. Mount Ebeko, Ebeko, Ebeko right on this little island right next to it at the south tip of Kamchatka. Additionally, Kluchevskoy volcano is erupting on the Kamchatka Peninsula. The others, like Shivalush, they stopped. Karimsky, haven't heard from it. Besmiani, what? Now that was the one that put off the 50,000 foot high blast last year. So where are all those? Well, instead, we get a 5.3 right next to Mount Ebigo, which just erupted. So again, taking one more look at it, it's an Equal spread of earthquakes going up across the Izu Ridge, coast of Japan, all the way up here, and then the biggest of the bunch, like throwing a pebble in a pond and spreading out same size in both directions. One more time, look at this. Pebble in a pond, you're throwing a rock in, in the water. That's where the splash occurs, the biggest of the bunch. Then equal spacing out in each direction. Look, 4.0, 4.6, up towards Alaska. Let me highlight them for you. 4.0, 4.6. And then going down to the south, 4.5 and 4.0. So wouldn't you say a 4.0 and a 4.6 and a 4.0 and a 4.5 are two of basically the same sized earthquakes on either side? Yes, they are. Now, yesterday, a 4.5 struck here right next to Anchorage. Now we get into the craton here and the edge of the craton, going up to the accretionary plain and the coastal plain. Basically, the edge of Laurentia, the edge of the North American plate. And we can look at it on the USGS map here, and you can see they have some faults marked going across Alaska on the interior. Again, it's, it's the edge of the craton, guys. So the earthquakes come off the thick red line and jump into the plate. In other words, the Pacific plate is transferring this energy across the red line, and the red line is the plate boundary. The plate boundary transfers that energy into the plate, and the plate tries to absorb it. But the plate acts like a wave guide again. It's guiding those waves of very low frequency down along the edge of the plate, down into the northwest of the United States, coming in from the northwest, going across the plate. Now, before we get into the northwest United States, like I said, Hawaii is swarming. Hawaii, smack in the middle of the Pacific plate, we have fracture zones that go across the Pacific plate. Look at it this way. Do you see the fracture zones? They're east and west facing. They almost look like ladders on a, well, rungs on a ladder or latitude on a map. Fracture zones east and west. They go up here to the north. They're almost equally spaced, wouldn't you say? Now look where they go to. They go back across and meet up with this undersea mount chain of volcanoes that really, it goes down around and curves like a letter C into the south point of Peru. And these under sea mounts, this is Easter Island right here. And we go back up and it curves up to the north, these under sea mount volcanoes, the whole chain of them. Everywhere east of there, we have our fracture zones going over to Leviathan. By the way, people think that's like some kind of natural feature. No. <laughs> that's like one of these old world maps, guys. My buddy who made this for me, the graphics, uh, or at least the coloring on here. Animatronic, he put that on there for us. Little, little joke. I told him to put some old world sea monsters on the map, you know. Okay, so going up to the north, we have our undersea mount chain of volcanoes, and they meet up with the Hawaiian island chain, which then, together, both go back up to Kamchatka. So you got to look at this from the greater view. Coming off of Kamchatka to the north, going down and meeting up with the Hawaiian island chain that branches off, goes out to the middle of these fracture zones. The undersea mount chain carries on further to the south and makes a letter C-shaped bend into South America. In other words, this cuts the whole Pacific in half, this undersea mount chain. Everywhere east of it, we have these fracture zones. There's one spot where the fracture zones really come through this letter C shape, and that's right here in the middle of it. So in the middle of this giant <laughs> letter C shape, it goes back across and meets up with where all of our deep earthquakes are taking place. 
So that hammering action, one more time, let me show it to you so you can really remember it. In the circular motion here, coming in on the underside of the plate, focusing in on the underside of the plate. Then it spreads out and across the plate. Once it gets to the middle of the Pacific, where the USGS has nothing, it spreads out even further and tries to equalize. And hence we get the equal spaced fracture zones across the east side of the Pacific, because everything over here is upwelling pressure, pretty much, coming up, and then it spreads out and across. Now, Hawaii, sandwiched right in the middle of it, right next to the spot, well, to the north of the spot, where the energy comes across. Now, if the push is big enough, for instance, we get a lot of deep earthquakes here on our letter D, and we get a lot of deep earthquakes here on our letter Ds, and we get a lot of deep earthquakes here on our letter Ds south of Japan, then in the middle of the Pacific plate, things start to increase pressure-wise. Now, what kind of pressure am I talking about? I don't even really know, to be quite frank. I call it a seismic force. It's the force that causes earthquakes and causes eruptions. It's a tension of some sort that develops in the plate, and I think we found the cause. The deep upwelling pressure coming from down below the plate from VLF which is being emitted from the core of the Earth, which is vibrating like a giant bass drum. And there's only one thing in Mother Nature that's big enough and powerful enough to create a large electromagnetic field and vibrate like a bass drum, creating very low frequency. And that's plasma, just like up in the upper ionosphere. But anyway, let's go zoom in on Hawaii and see where all the earthquakes are taking place. In the past three days, it's a predominance, of course, along the coast, but it's centered around something along the coast. We spread out up to Mauna Loa, and we go even further all the way up on the north side of Mauna Kea. But like I said, the bulk is along the coast, and it's going right up to the crater of Kilauea itself. And let me show it to you. A picture speaks a thousand words for my Hawaiian viewers. And of course, the Middle East Rift Zone's recharging. It's gotta be. All the earthquakes going along the coast here and up to the peak of Kilauea. A few smaller, but same-sized earthquakes going on at Mauna Loa and on the north side of Mauna Kea. But what could cause all of this to start to quake? There's only one thing that could cause all of that to start to quake, and that's rising magma refilling into the Middle East Rift Zone, which eventually it will get to the point where it reaches its breaking point. So looking at it from a side profile, all of this is the Middle East Rift Zone. And it actually goes down to the south a little bit too, but I would consider all this right here. Going up, there's Kilauea, here's Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, here's Pu'u'o'o, going down to the other flows down to the east southeast. The big lava flow happened this past year down over here on the east side, and the magma contents of the magma chamber drained down and over and out. And so when this drained down over and out on the side, the top collapsed by a few thousand feet. So it went down like 2,000 feet at the top. Now the magma is recharging back inside of here and pushing back up. Now there's a gravel pit on top of this that's collapsed down 2,000 feet. On the back side, we have Mauna Loa. On the very far back side, we have Mauna Kea. And out here on the left-hand side or south side, we have Lo'ihi. So all the earthquakes are going from the top of Kilauea back up to the top of Mauna Loa, back up on the north side of Mauna Kea. It's charging in the whole island now. The whole island is charging. Now, what does that mean? It just means that magma is reflowing back into any areas that it was previously vacated from. Now, I would think it's always full, but that there's like a charging capacity maybe that it can hold or maybe even a stretching capacity of some kind. But, or an elastic quality to that, but I can't prove that. All I know is that there's seismic activity spreading out from Kilauea down along the coast of Loi, back up to Mauna Loa, back up to Mauna Kea. What could cause all that? With the center of it being the Middle East Rift Zone. Come on, no duh. The center of the Middle East Rift Zone is obviously recharging. Will it blow? Well, they will know. There'll be some kind of harmonic tremors, most likely, that show up beforehand. Sulfur dioxide levels will go up. The sensors out there will start to go off, and they will warn people. Now, I thought it would take about a year for that to happen. It's been a year and a half. Well, well no, two years. It's been two years. They said like 10. So, 
Uh, you know, they said a long time in the future. I don't know. I watch it all the time, and if I see it flare back up, I keep an eye on it. Because all it takes is one big push to come in, and the push that's going around right now is pretty darn big. It's enough to displace both plates on either side, all the way around Australia and all the way around South America. So the fours go across the north side of the Pacific, and they dead end right into the edge of the North American Craton in the Pacific Northwest, Canada. At the Canada-Alaska border region, that's where the fours came rolling in. With all this activity around the rest of the plate, I think we're about ready to take another step up. This last step up, we went up to 5.5 around the whole planet. I think this time, it's going to be sixes. I think this week, going throughout starting tomorrow, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I think we're going to be reporting on a bunch of 6.0 range activity or greater, but likely a flurry of sixes, enough to get everyone's attention. And it'll be at the middle points between our current sets of major earthquake clusters. So, I mean, you can kind of see where there's a lack of earthquake activity in between the clusters. Those are the spots we're going to watch. And, for instance, we have the new volcano. Like I said, new volcano erupting over here, right in the middle of this hot mess over in Indonesia. That's a sign. And same with New Caledonia going quiet here. This big open area here where we have a set of arrows. That going quiet? Mm, that's not good. Down in New Zealand, after all the movement that happened this past week, look, we got a six down to the south. I would look down in south central New Zealand. Look where the edge of those rings come together. And it could go bigger than what we're looking at now. So I want everybody to be ready. And then, of course, that doesn't even factor into the United States yet. Like I said, this is going to be a long update. So Hawaii's swarming. Alaska's starting to move. This is the last four days. But let's just look at the last two days. And you'll see a spread of quakes going down through Texas, back up into Kansas and Oklahoma, over to Kentucky's border with Ohio. Now that matches with the edge of the Craton. It's matching with the inside edge of the Craton. All the earthquakes, I think all of them, are on the inside edge or the northern side of the arrows going right down to Texas. So the Craton's moving. There's a shift taking place in the middle of the Craton. Now here is the New Madrid seismic zone. And guess what stopped? Hotspot. The hotspots stopped. Now, we could go check again just to make sure. I mean, you know, before I say they completely stopped, let's go take one gander at it. I looked earlier, but gander. Oh, man. I've been in the Midwest too long. I said gander. Hey, y'all. I'm going to take a gander. Oh, man, I love it. Okay, all right. Here we are. Yeah, I'm not seeing very much of anything. A whole lot of nothing. But wait, let's go look at Google Earth and see what's on Google Earth. I mean, sometimes they filter them out. So if it's not an actual fire, they, the satellite removes the, moves the filter. Okay, yeah, so we only have a handful. Look at this. Quite literally, we have maybe 10 and we have the spot down in South Florida, which we're going to write that off in South Florida right now as swamp gas. No, just kidding. As farmers burning their fields, for the most part. The others going up to the north, power lines. So I just wonder. i got to go zoom in and see. Could be farmers burning their fields. But oh, look at this. Look at this. Look at this giant power generation station. Is this a nuclear power plant? Is this a nuke plant? Hold on. What is this place? Yep, a nuclear power plant. And we got a hot spot right next to it. Look at the power lines coming out from it. Now, nobody can tell me that there's a whole bunch of nuclear power plants all over the place. And there's like two per state, maybe, at the most. Some have one, some have none. So we're right next within a few miles of the power plant, the huge Nuke station. What about down here? Hopeful. Oh, yeah, okay, we're right along train tracks, and we're right along another set of power lines. Yep. And they go right back up here to the nuke plant. So, all right. That seals the deal for me. What about down here in Florida? Zellwood, Florida, in the middle of a lake. Middle of a lake. Looks like a nice little community there. Some kind of lake community. A little airstrip there. 
boy, I don't see anything here except for a lake. But you know what? We have to look within a few miles around. And this gets into, you know what? My buddy Tattoo down in Florida, he lives right down in Jacksonville. He'll know what this area is. He's probably even been, he probably has been there. Orlando, isn't that like Disney World right there? <sighs> All right, but what I'm trying to show you guys is there's nothing. There's like a handful down here to the south and the south, right? Now look, once we go up to the north, look. Do you guys see what we have going on up here to the north? All of a sudden, across Iowa, going up across Minnesota. Is that Minnesota? Yeah, we're in Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota. Now, I need to zoom in and see what's in Iowa here and just take a look. Swan, Iowa. Man, we got rivers. We've got rivers and a few roads. And a set of train tracks. See, this train track stuff, VLF, very low frequency. You know, you got or high frequency too, because uh, some ham operators will go hook up their radio equipment to a railroad line. Don't do this, by the way. That's I think it's pretty illegal to do that if you're a radio operator. But I mean, I guess in an emergency scenario or something, and they'll use sections of track to be at however long of an antenna that they need, and you can pump a lot of power into it without melting it. All right, let's go down here. Yeah, you put too much power into your antenna. Guess what's going to happen to your antenna? And it might either blow out your... Depending on how strong of a transmitter you've got, you could either melt your antenna like Tattoo did. He did it on video, too, so you could see it turn into plasma. You could see the steel vaporize. Vaporized steel... Let me tell you a quick story. Vaporized steel using a few hundred watts... And a radio transmitter. Done from the antenna top of a truck. Outside. Now, vaporizing steel. And you could watch it. It's on Tattoot's channel. Maybe we can it's, find it some other time. I don't want to waste your night looking up old videos. But So you can vaporize steel using a few hundred watts. Now, let's go up here into the northwest United States. And I'm going to turn on our last day's worth of 0.0, .0 and greater earthquakes. I guess sip my coffee, too. I've got a meowing cat. We've got a cat, and she's very serious. Extremely serious. You know what? Let me go tend to this. Hold on, guys. Hold on. I just have the door shut because I thought you didn't want to hear me, girl. All right. The cat may come in. She might not. Come on in, babe. Very unprofessional, but that's the way we do it. So looking overall on the West Coast, we go in here into the Northwest and we have a handful of earthquakes. We have a 0, 0.0 and a 1.1 and a 1.5 out in the Puget Sound right on the edge of the Olympic Peninsula. So let's go look these up, though. I want to see where these earthquakes are. And then we have to check something else. We have to check the tremors. Now, the tremors are not exactly earthquakes. They're vibrations as the plate shifts. But right now, we're looking up the quakes first. The, the quakes are fractures in the plate that are happening at a fault or next to a volcano or next to a power line that's being precipitated by electrons coming out of the power line or going into them. But on this... We are on the side of Mount Rainier. So this earthquake coming in right on the flank, west-northwest side, Mount Rainier. We were in the crater down below it a few days ago. A few small earthquakes about the same size. Think of this like a circus tent top, where the center rises. That was our earthquakes a few days ago below the center. And then the outside edge rises. The flanks begin to rise. So something's going on around the volcano, and we already know there's plate shiftage that's finally starting to slow down. And that gets me into the tremors that I just mentioned. So tremors, again, these are not really earthquakes. These are small vibrations as the plate shifts. There's 43 of them here on the screen from yesterday, and they're centered down in southwest Oregon, a cluster of them. 
Now I can turn on something here, the imagery, and it might aid you in seeing, like an arrow pointing into where the tremors are taking place. Let me go show you on the USGS map here. There we go. So like an arrow pointing into southwest Oregon, the southern arm, or the arrow pinnacle point of the Juan de Fuga fracture zone, points in. And that tension is coming into North America, vibrating the plate, but it's coming in from the Pacific plate. Those jagged edges belong to the Pacific plate. So the tension is coming in from the west, and it's transferring up and into North America. You have to understand that North America is actually up above the Pacific plate. Of course, I mean, we know that, right? It's down far below. Here's the, how many feet below sea level are we? You know, 8,000, 10,000 feet below sea level sea level here, and then we come up to the surface, and North America is in between the two, of course. And that's where we start seeing our earthquakes start to translate from the tremors. So let's get back to the earthquakes now. So there's tremors happening across here in southwest Oregon, but the earthquakes are spreading over to the volcano. Wonder why that would be. Well, let's see. If we're shifting down here and vibrating down here, and we're pushing in from out in the jagged edges of the Juan de Fuca fracture zone and the magma chambers for Mount Rainier and all the other volcanoes for that matter going down across California are all nestled into the edge of the plate and tensions coming in and up through it what do you think is going to happen when that tension reaches the magma chamber inside of the plate it's going to compress it we're going to see a few small earthquakes and it start to rise up at the center and that's what's going on that's what happened a few days ago at Mount Rainier it's also what's happened over at Yellowstone but the magma chamber for Yellowstone is so much bigger. It's 11 Grand Canyons in size. It goes from the surface at Wyoming down below central Idaho. And the feeder for it actually technically goes down and over below Oregon. But the center of the magma chamber is really right below here where the small earthquakes are taking place. Now think of it this way though. How much energy do you think it would take to displace 11 Grand Canyons of magma all the way up to the surface causing a swarm up at Yellowstone Park directly inside the park. We also had hot spots appear inside of the park two days ago. You know what? I got to go check now. Are there any more today? There are there. I mean, we got to go look. And I didn't even go look up the rest of these hot spots up here to the north. But look, once we get into South Dakota and North Dakota, we have a bunch of oil fields that could be flaring off. And likely they are. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I could go look in here. They might not find anything. But there are oil fields up here. I just don't know where they are. Zooming in on these spots, though, I mean, look, we we're right next to train tracks again. That's getting, that's getting weird with the train tracks. Somebody said to me, do you think it could be that the, you're just sensing the heat from the engines as the trains are exhausting off? And I said, well, maybe, but then it would be in a line perfectly following the train tracks all the way up across an area, and it's just not doing that. It's kind of on either side. All right, so I wanted to look and see if there's any hot spots at Yellowstone, and there are not. It's shifted. There's a couple hot spots up here now on the northwest side of Yellowstone in Montana. Wait, the burn location for the man. Guys, hold on. We have two hot spots here on the outskirts of Yellowstone National Park on the Montana side of the border. And they're directly parallel within a few miles where that guy and his dogs went hiking. And they came up here to this what's normally a temperate spring in here it's normally temperate they would swim in it and instead it was boiling and they didn't know it it was superheated the dogs jumped in and he went in after him and it's just bad news but that's where the hot spots are what about up at great falls montana now we're out here on the edge of great falls montana what is over here there's some farmland Oh, wait. A pipeline. A pipeline right there. Okay, so a pipeline's venting, burning off. Are we on the edge of an Air Force Base, too? Hold on. Mal Malmstrom Air Force Base. We're right next to an Air Force Base as well on the other side of town. Well, somebody needs to get out there and go check and see what's going on. Hot spot. Oh, wait. Look, look. I just need to zoom in closer. We're at the high voltage power lines. We're directly at them. These are the big kind, the big towers. Let's get out of the reds and just get a shot of it here. Oh, yeah, look where they all come together right there. 
I wonder if we have a street level view. Nope. But yeah, there, there you see it. I mean, there's a huge intersection of power lines there. All right, arcing of some kind, some kind of electrical discharge that's being picked up on the satellite by a hot spot. Okay, so let's recap. Mount Rainier, Yellowstone, going into the park and up around the park, we have hot spots, earthquakes above the magma chamber. What do you think could cause that? Obviously, some kind of electrical discharge coming up out of the magma or going down into it. Down in southwest Oregon, look at that. We're at Prospect, Oregon. But I do recall seeing that just on the map here. Look. This is right where the tremors are, isn't it? Let's look again on the topographic view. Grants Pass, Medford. It is. It's right next to it. Let's see how close we are. Here is Medford. There's Medford and Grants Pass, and the new earthquake is at Crater Lake. Wow. It's at Crater Lake. Let's put the coordinates in. So an earthquake inside of Crater Lake. Right in the middle of it. I don't know much about Crater Lake. I, I don't think we've had to look up many earthquakes here before. Let's go read it. Maybe a handful in the entire time I've been online it has struck here. The spectacular 8 by 10 kilometer crater Lake Caldera in the southern Cascades of Oregon formed about 7,700 years ago as a result of a collapse of a complex of overlapping shield and stratovolcanoes known as Mount Mazama. The cone building stage, during which at least five andesitic and dacitic shields and stratovolcanoes were constructed, took place between about 420 and 40,000 years ago. It's huge. Wow. All right. You know what? Looks like there's something over here on the other side of it, too. Look at that. Maybe even a more ancient complex. That is. It certainly is. Look at that. Oh, very interesting, isn't it? Hey, look, we have hotspots from when? When were these hotspots? September 10th. That's right. I saved all those from September 10th. Okay. So, hotspots previously right next to Crater Lake, where we now have earthquakes today. And it's the first earthquake. Let's just make sure it's not an explosion or something. 2.8 kilometer depth. Okay. Let's carry on down into Northern California. Which should we pull first? The 1.1 or the 1.0? Let's pull the 1.0 first. Shingle Town, California. The 1.1 is about 5 miles east by northeast. So we'll just... Put this one in and look five miles to the east. See what's there. There's the earthquake epicenter. What do we have right down here? We have a road of some kind. Oh, no, wait. Is that a road? If it is, it's the most eroded road I've ever seen. Now, five miles east by northeast puts us right over here, and that puts us at the base of Jack's Backbone Volcanic Butte. Jack's Backbone. Never heard of it before, but I have heard of the others over to the east, like this, for instance. See this? This is a lava flow. It's not a forest fire location or anything. You can still see the black basalt and even igneous rock still exposed there. Goes back up here to the Tumble Buttes south. Tumble Buttes, place mark from the Smithsonian if you want to read it. Look at that. Through the woods. A line of cinder cones along a north-northwest to south-southeast trending fissure has produced a series of youthful-looking lava flows. The most prominent of these is Devil's Rock Garden, a thick, blocky, andesitic lava flow. Andesite? Big. Okay, and our power lines, of, or something, again, I would think these are the power lines, but it could be a pipeline of some kind. They could be buried power line, maybe, but it's not a road. And it just goes across the whole county and goes up and connects up to the north. I'm, I'm thinking pipeline. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a pipeline. This is a station. They have solar panels for, I guess, emergency power or something. Or maybe they provide all the power there. There's the pipelines. Okay, so the pipelines go down next to the spot, which is even more interesting. I wonder if we have any other hot spots or anything else nearby. Across the north tip of the valley, we do. Okay, we'll get into that in a second. So both earthquakes are on the side of a volcano, basically. Same with this earthquake up here in the middle of Crater Lake. 
Same with these earthquakes here in Idaho, above the deepest part of the magma chamber for Yellowstone. Going up into the park, actually at Yellowstone, then going up next to the hot spots up in Montana, and Mount Rainier getting hit. Not to mention Oregon still shifting with 40 at least tremors from the slow slip. Now down into western California, northwest California, the geysers at Clear Lake still moving. Geothermal field here where they drilled in to get steam. And I'll just show it to you. I show it every day almost, if not multiple times a day when I do my updates. This thing's constantly moving and it's constantly shifting, but they've drilled into it so many times. There's a bunch of drill points that go down a few hundred to a few thousand feet into the volcanic field to get steam to turn the turbines here. And the turbines and electrical generation again on the side of Clear Lake volcanic field. And that's where the swarm is. Now, the number of earthquakes here is actually starting to go back up a little bit, and the magnitudes are leveling off in the mid-range, too level. Up to the north, it's all ones and zeros. Now, I would call this low. The amount coming in here right now, while each volcano is getting hit, it's low. We're looking for something to release out here in the ocean now that the slow slip is slowing down. The slow slip has been going for like two months almost. These little red dots here on the west coast, shifting around between Washington, Vancouver Island, Northern California, back and forth through here on land. And we can just go back and scroll back past several days to see that if you guys need to. I mean, you guys have been following along with me, most likely. The chances of you being a brand new viewer here are pretty slim. But we'll just go back, let's say, 10 days. No, 14 days, two weeks. There. Do you see all the red dots here up in Vancouver? That's on November 14th. So bring it forward four days. Kind of splits in half, goes down into Oregon mainly. Going by the 20th, it's centered down in Oregon by the 20th. 21st, goes back up into Washington. 22nd, goes back down into Oregon and Northern California. 23rd, centered in Oregon. 24th, Oregon going back up to the Washington border. 25th, hush hush, but that's a system outage. I think. Then it shows back up in California, up in the north tip of the valley, or the south tip of the Juan de Fuca. 27th, yesterday, that's where we're talking about right now. Do we have today's yet? We do not have today's tremors yet, if there are any. But it's decreasing. The number of tremors is going down. And the spots that I just showed you are here along the coast. Well, they push into the edge of the crater. And then our earthquakes, well... That gets us back into what I showed you at the start of the update. The standing waves seek out the middle points, the weak points. So the standing wave, the equally spaced quakes, spread out across the zone, which is the red line, the thick red line. Once it gets into North America, it tries to spread across the plate, and it follows the edge of the craton, path of least resistance. Now, looking at California, you're going to see a line of earthquakes going right down along the coast. It's pretty obvious. South of the Bay Area, down here along the creeping section of the San Andreas, we go down here to Parkfield, but then we jump out into the ocean. Look at this. At Lompoc, California, we jump out into the ocean for some reason. Let me show you what's there. Two things are here. Two interesting things are here. One is something I've shown previously. The other is something I noticed a few hours ago. So first I'll show you what we've always seen in the past when we look down here. Here's the coast. And right off the coast, and along the coast, but right off the coast, all of these. Platform Hermosa. Oil and gas. And this, again, platform harvest. Oil and gas right next to it. Now we go on to land and there's even more. And there's also some military installations through here. But going up and around, I think that's the Air Force Base. Up here on the north side, all of these. I think these are, wait, no. Do I have them marked? Ah, on the north side, up here. Hey, wait a second. We have a hot spot. Guys, we've got a hot spot out in California. Oh wait, look where it is. Look where the hot spot is. It's in the middle of an oil and gas pumping operation. This is, wait, that's not an oil and gas pumping operation, is it? 
Is it? Let's see. Do I see any well? Oh, yeah. Sure is. There's the shadow of the jack of the pump. I don't have any place marks on this. I have it down to the south. All of this is oil. Wow. Okay, well, I'm glad I looked. Oh, we're, oh, my goodness gracious, guys. We're right on the north side of Los Alamos. Oh, man, hold on. Okay, look, I just got done freaking out for a second. We're on the north side of Los Alamos. I'm about ready to get shut down by the government or something. We're on the north side of one of the most famous locations. Hotspot, good fire pixel, 572 Kelvin. Let's, let's go convert Kelvin to Fahrenheit. K to F degrees. And what was it again? 572 Kelvin. 572. It's 500. There, it's about the same. 569.93 Fahrenheit. And that's okay. I got to go look it up now on the actual satellite. So we have a fire pixel there. We've got an earthquake there. We've got an oil pumping operation there. I... <sighs> And it's California. Oh, go ahead and shut it. All good. All right. Sorry, guys. Talking to Duchess. So here's Lompoc. And the hot spot's somewhere right up in here. I guess I need to go to the next station to the north. Oh, of course. They have a cutoff right there. No way. They've got it cut off right there. That's hilarious. All right. Well, well let's see if we can see it this way. Yeah. Oh, whoop. oh look. Hold on. Look. They wide it out. Ha! They wide it out. And then it, it appears right there. Uh, maybe it appeared the first time and they widened it out. Wow, censorship wide again. What are they? Oh, let me guess. They're going through another equinox. Just an equinox we never knew was going to happen. Second equinox, you know, it's like 11 Z's. Okay, down here, Lompoc. <laughs> Whoopsie. Uh oh. Uh oh. And look, it's even got a timestamp on it. It actually has a timestamp to this. <laughs> what is that? Oh man, November 28th, 2020, 1731 and 17. 1731, 17. Wonderful. To 2126, it just goes white for like an hour. But it doesn't matter because we can still see the leftover remnants of the hotspot here. So it's showing up on satellite, despite their best efforts to hide it. My goodness gracious. Wonderful stuff we have going on here. Hey, what do you got to be? Sherlock Holmes or something? Elementary, my dear Watson. Hubba, hubba, hubba. Let's go up here into the California-Nevada border and go look what's at Mammoth Lakes. Well, let's see. If this holds true with everything else that I've shown you in the update, there should be something of volcanic significance at Mammoth Lakes. Just because, I mean, the last 30 earthquakes I just showed you are all going to volcanic locations. What about this one? But I'll be darned. Look, we're right in the middle of Long Valley Caldera. We're on the side or the flank of Mammoth Mountain. So it is. Excuse me one moment. That last little sip of coffee went down the wrong, the wrong pipe. Now, that'll, that'll wake you up. My eyes are watering. Okay, so here we are. We're back here in Long Valley. Oh, thank, thanks, babe. Ah, what is this? I don't get any product placement, so I'm not going to name the soda beverage I'm drinking. All right. Ah, much better. In the middle of Long Valley Caldera, that's where the other cluster of earthquakes is. 
right next to Mammoth Mountain. We go across the border. We go back over to Monte Cristo Hills, Volcanic Buttes. We go down to the south. We go into Kozo Volcanic Field. That's where the earthquakes start here, right next to them. And then we go down to the Lava Mountains. We jump over to the east and we're at the Yubihibi Craters. We jump over further to the east and we're at the nuclear test sites. Now, do I need to prove that all to you or can you guys go look this up? I mean, I should. I should at least prove to you that Kozo Field is a volcano. Same with down to Lava Mountains. Same with over to Yubihibi Craters. Same with over to the nuclear test site. There will always be someone new here who does not know what I'm talking about. So, for instance, right down here. Okay, we're right on the edge of Kozo Volcanic Field. And there's a geothermal pumping operation here called Devil's Kitchen, where they drilled into this volcanic field to get steam. So it's a double weak point. Mother Nature has already weakened it from down below. Humans drilled in a bunch of times from up above. And that's where our earthquakes start. And they go in a line on the east side of all these lava flows, which are part of Volcano Peak and it's 10 other or 12 other eruptive points. I think there's like 15 there total. I don't know. I have to go back and count. And then we go down here to the Lava Mountains. And that line of earthquakes goes exactly in that path from Kozo Field down to Lava Mountains. Then the 0 0.8 all the way out here over at the border, Shoshone, California, I'll put the coordinates in. That'll make it a little easier. And over to the east. This is for the new people. New people. Take a look. There's the Ryan craters. Here are the Yubihibi craters. Did I say next to the Yubihibi craters? Okay. Should have said next to the Ryan craters. They're right next to each other, and they're two versions of basically the same thing. Only Yubihibi craters had a big blast in the past year. And this is a big crater in the ground, not a mountain top look at it from the side there we go you can see it there that thing blew out in the past so you behave craters down to the east southeast ryan craters and on the side of ryan craters black butte mountain volcano and the new earthquake what else do we have out here anything else nothing ryan craters then over to the nuke test site i've shown that so many times it's doomtown here's the earthquake epicenter here is Doomtown. Indian Springs, you guys know about Indian Springs, Doomtown, Range 61. Well, all of these are underground craters, or, well, underground blast points that turned into craters, and they're all from nuclear tests. And I show them whenever I can, whenever an earthquake strikes here, as an example of man-made faults. So they're not doing nuke tests there now. U.S. Nuke Operation Takato. September 22nd, 1983, 150 kilotons. That's a lot. But they have megaton blast. That's thousands of kilotons that they've done there as well. But just a small earthquake. So in other words, we're going from volcano to volcano to volcano. Then we go to drill point, then back to volcanoes, then over to another man-made point, which is a blast point. As we go further to the south, this lone 2.6 out the middle of the Mojave Desert is on the side of the Lavic Lake volcanic field. So it's all the volcanoes getting hit right now. But this is low. This activity is just the first wave. It starts to hit the volcanoes first. We're going to flare back up. It's going to get really big this week on the west coast. So look where we are. We're right next to the high tension voltage transmission lines, and there's multiple sets of them, at least three towers side by side going all the way across the desert. It's the power transfer point across the Mojave. There's like another spot all the way down to the south. But this is it. And that's where the earthquakes are. But we're next to Lavic Lake. So it's a double weak point. Pisgah Crater. Mother Nature's punctured, punctured the plate. And then add in the electrical effect. As we go down into the L.A. Basin. Let's go look them up. Let's start up here on the north side. North side of L.A. Silmar, California, and paste the coordinates in, go see what's there. You guys got to do this. You got to do this on every small earthquake, especially in like LA. You'll find stuff. Okay, perfect example right here. Do you see this? Fracking oil drilling operation. Well, Aliso Canyon, the gas storage area. This is the spot that blew open. 
and released its contents out. Hundreds of thousands of people up here had to evacuate. Well, now we have a new earthquake right next to it again. Just like last time. Now, is this some kind of quarry blast or explosion or something? No, it's down at 8 kilometers. Anytime I see earthquakes around the gas storage location, guys, I get a little worried. Because last time, the earthquake showed up. Below that location and around it, the professionals ignored. They said there was no relation. No relation. They said it was too far below to be related. I said, what? Well, it's a sign of pressure coming in. Then the place blew. Hundreds of thousands of people evacuated. Instant nosebleeds with people. As soon as the gases, it was some kind of corrosive gas in there as well. I don't know what it was, but it made everybody sick. It wasn't just methane. Okay, now we're down in the middle of L.A., right? Is that where we are? Looks like it. East Los Angeles. Now we're east of the oil pumping operations at Baldwin Hills. And we're west of the oil pumping operations here, which I don't even have the name on. But you can see the shadows of the jacks of the pumps on the ground. And they're all over the hillside here. South San Gabriel, Gabriel. And I always look 6 to 10 miles for our nearest pumping operations because they can drill out at an angle. And in this case, let's see how many miles it is. So from the earthquake epicenter here, we'll just get a rough click. And we're 6 to 7 miles to the center of the oil pumping operation here. 6 miles, basically. And they can drill out by several miles. So, for instance, they could drill from here, down, and over, and be somewhere down below here. And then there's just a hop, skip, and a jump for a fracture to form, or for a fault to become activated or charged by that hydraulic charging from the fracking. There may even be old wells right through here that I just don't know about and don't have marked. Sometimes they're still even functional, stuck into a back area with a fence built around it or something, or on the edge of a park. Okay, well, backing it out, L.A., this is the spot also where we saw the huge gas explosion when the sewers filled with gas. Are we next to the... La Brea Tar Pit? I don't know where the La Brea Tar Pit is. I just want to see where it is in relation to this. La Brea Tar Pit. Oh man, we're right next to him. Right next to him, just a couple miles over to the west. Okay, well we're back at the La Brea Tar Pit. Uh-oh. Okay, let's move right along. Mike from St. Louis. What's a volcano? You guys ever see the movie uh, Volcano with Tommy Lee Jones? It's the one where the volcano erupts in downtown L.A. Well, Tommy Lee Jones is the disaster manager for L.A. And his character is named Mike. And they call him Mike from St. Louis. Or The whole movie is Mike from St. Louis. Mike from St. Louis. Mike from St. Louis. And everybody's like, dude, are they talking about you? And I'm like, no, no, this movie was made forever ago. Unless somebody time traveled to me. <laughs> Maybe they did, <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, that's kind of funny. And he didn't know what a volcano was. He's like having to have a vol He's the disaster manager, but didn't know about... Okay, well, the La Brea Tar Pits are in the movie anyway. We have a diagonal line of quakes. Now, the only thing here in Southern California that's changed in the last couple days is the area, the size of the movement has increased. The number of earthquakes and the magnitudes behind it not so much so. It stayed even. Zeros, ones, near 2.0. But that's it. But it's pretty obvious it's a diagonal line of quakes, right? Now, we just went across a bunch of pumping operations up here on the north side. Once we get over to the east, we're strictly on faults. Let me show you. So, Southern California. Once we get down here, our earthquakes branch off the San Andreas. Up here, we're at these pumping operations across North L.A., but then we get down to the south and we go right down in a perfect line west of Salton Sea, dead, end, dead ends down into the border with Mexico. Now, that's where our other little cluster or outbreak is taking place, down at Salton Sea Volcano. Right down to the border at the geothermal pumping operations. And I can show it to you if you don't believe me there's a volcano in Southern California on the side of Salton Sea. There's people that don't believe everything on the internet. But I like to show it. These are all Smithsonian place marked. And, you know, sometimes it's educational, even for people out in California who didn't know. 
but the volcano at the south tip of Salton Sea has been drilled a bunch of times to get steam. And all of these geothermal turbines, the pipelines go out to drill points. And we go right down here to the border. There's Imperial California. There's El Centro. Here's the border with Mexico. And there's our last geothermal pumping operation right down here at the border. And lo and behold, that's where our last little set of earthquakes trails off. So one more time, class. Everyone, please pay attention now. Earthquake striking at pretty much every volcanic center going all the way down the coast. Save just a few on the creeping section of the San Andreas. And we go back down to our pumping operations at Lompoc, where we have a hot spot. Over to the east, we're at our other sets of volcanoes. Long Valley Caldera, Monte Cristo, where the predominance is taking place. The flow down into Ridgecrest, China Lake, has been cut off. The flow into Southern California, staying steady but not big. The flow is coming in from the northwest, we know that. Now look at it overall this way, and you'll see a line of earthquakes coming down the coast, going to the pumping operations, and going back down into L.A. now. So it's bypassing East California entirely and going along the coast. The San Andreas is starting to move significantly to the point where it's hitting the oil pumping operations and all the volcanoes down along the way on the interior of the coast over the border. So the volcanoes are moving at the border. The pumping operations are moving along the coast. We have diagonal lines of earthquakes along the coast that go back up to here, which just got done shifting with a slow slip. Or it's nearing the end or dying down on its slow slip. Everything over to the east in the last day, look at this. Hush, hush. Quiet. One, 1. 1.5, is that right? One, 1.5. Let me make sure this is the last day. It is. So I'm going to turn back on the last seven days. But look, everything across the rest of the plate has gone hush-hush quiet, which means that we're going to be seeing an increase spread out. First, it should slam on the West Coast, then go down into California, then across the edge of the Craton. And it should go fives, fours, threes across the plate. I'll have a new forecast out tomorrow, tomorrow's Sunday, and we will do a new forecast for the week, for the next seven days. Tomorrow, most likely in the afternoon, my time, Central Time, United States. That takes me back to the start of this whole update, guys, because by the time tomorrow, we might be dealing with, I might be reporting on a big earthquake either tonight or tomorrow, as we're getting to a point where whole plates are shifting around the area that originally pushed up from underneath. And when whole plates start to move in a day or two, how much force do you think it would take to displace everything from Australia to India and everything from Antarctica all the way up to the Caribbean? A lot. In a day's time, two days, please. It's a lot of energy. I mean, it's unfathomable how much energy that would be. So that would mean the areas between the areas that are moving are going to be filled in with larger earthquakes. And I think it's going to be going back up in the 6th range over the next several days, and maybe bigger over here on the West Pacific at Indonesia, where that new volcano suddenly showed up. Oh man, what an update. That's a long one. That is a long... Oh, uh, Africa! Look, I still need to know, did the X get hit or anywhere interior of the plate? I got contacted, people leaving me comments down below video, but... That's not exactly a first-hand good report, so we need to find out if that happened. Other than that, I'm watching, waiting. As soon as that big one hits, I'll jump back on. We could go back up into the 7 range in Indonesia. Sixes around the plate are due. Middle points between our sets of earthquakes, and tomorrow will be the forecast for the whole planet. Do you have an earthquake plan? Do you? Do you know what to do when an earthquake strikes, I guess is the best question I should ask you. You should at least think about what you'll do if an earthquake strikes. Now, I had somebody actually chastise me. It's a critic who actually, you know, is an unreasonable critic. You know, you get those all over the world. But this person sent me a private message telling me that it's bad to tell people to go outside during an earthquake. And I'm never talking about going outside during an earthquake. I tell people to shelter in place underneath a table or a desk. And if you don't feel confident that your structure is going to survive, that's when you would be mobile to get outside. And 
the USGS has a whole thing on this, as well as the Centers for Disease Control and Ready.gov and all the other sites around the world. If you go look up their earthquake preparedness plans, they recommend that you have a place picked outside to go to to congregate right after the earthquake in case you're not confident in the structure that you're in. You're, of course, supposed to take immediate shelter. I've said this a thousand times. I'll say it a thousand and one. Running around and screaming earthquake is pointless. Everybody already knows that an earthquake's happening. You don't have to run around and scream it. It's better to go find a table or a desk immediately and get under it and wave at the people you see running to get under there with you. Or point to one and say, get underneath a table or a desk. Now that's not going to stop a collapsing building. Like I said, so if you're not competent in your structure, let's say you're in a brick or a cinder block building. Okay, well you might be in a big enough earthquake where you need to immediately exit the building. Whereas a person next door to you in a wood frame building would be just sheltering in place. So if you're going outside, you need to have your areas pre-picked like a fire drill. You would know where to go. And this is the recommendations from the USGS, the CDC, ready.gov, etc. I'm taking the time to say this because somebody actually said that you shouldn't go outside. And that's not true. I would suggest staying inside and trying to weather it out. And that's why you've got to have a table or a desk. And you can even get one at Goodwill or, you know, most people have friends and family who are trying to get rid of this old furniture. <laughs> you could probably get something from friends and family if you really didn't have anything to get underneath. So it's just a suggestion. Now, the more important point on this is preparedness. You need to have an emergency kit. Because whether you stay underneath the table or desk or whether you go outside, you're going to need a few supplies if the power is off or if you're cut off without help for a fair amount of time. I've recommended everything from food and water for a few days to flashlight, batteries, communication. You could even do something as basic as a whistle. You know, a whistle, if you're trapped, screaming is going to be wasting so much energy. And if you only have a little bit of water or maybe none at all, a whistle can be heard further, and it can resonate through metal, whereas a voice doesn't. Just think about it. And it can go through small pockets. A whistle can be heard more, and it's easier to operate. So you might want to think about that, your emergency kit. And the other things, uh, sanitation, medication. And you will think of so many other things to put in there. I'm just getting the ball rolling, okay? Now I'm going to save this as a video. We will save this and put it out over on YouTube. So you guys can watch it back, and I'll premiere it back within, let's say, about an hour, hopefully. We'll get it playing over on YouTube. So we'll be back if anything else goes down. Word up and much love to everybody whose name is scrolling by here on the side, and, of course, all the people who watch. You guys, thank you so much. Everybody on Twitch, you've made a huge difference. Massive difference in the way that this information is received. And whether or not I'm here, you guys are still sharing info, and that's becoming a community of seismic aware people that share information amongst each other. It's needed at this time. So I'm happy to be facilitating that. And then everybody who watches on YouTube, thank you. You've grown my channel. Please subscribe. You hear it all the time. Please subscribe. Please hit the like button over on YouTube. It does make a difference, you know, whether or not it gets seen or not. I'll be back. Peace out, guys.